recall the story of Philip and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8? The Bible says the eunuch had been to Jerusalem to worship. And as he returned home in his chariot, he read from the Old Testament. Do you remember which book and which chapter that he was reading? His Bible didn't have chapter divisions like ours do, but it was Isaiah chapter 53. That's the beloved passage about the one who would be led as a sheep to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer, this one was silent. Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? Verse 30. And the eunuch replied, how can I unless someone guides me? Verse 31. Then he asked a pointed question about what he was studying. Of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? So the eunuch believed this passage in Isaiah 53 was about an individual, a person, but he didn't know who. Was Isaiah saying this would happen to him or was he talking about someone else? That's when Philip began at this same scripture and preached Jesus to him. Verse 35, that section of scripture, Isaiah 53, is one of the most vivid prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament. It's the passage that says he would have a humble beginning and would grow up to be despised and rejected by men. It says he was wounded for our transgressions and that God laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says what the eunuch was reading. He was silent before his accusers. He died with the wicked and was with the rich in his death. He was numbered with the transgressors and made intercession for sinners. You find all of that in Isaiah chapter 53. Now, we've already looked at this amazing prophecy in Isaiah 53. And remember that there are many other predictions of Jesus in the Old Testament. This is just one, but it's surely one of the strongest. One of the great mysteries to Christians is how anyone could read the words of Isaiah 53 and not see Jesus. How can an atheist or a skeptic reject it as a prophecy of Christ? And what about Jews? who don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. After all, the book of Isaiah was delivered to the Jewish people first. They read it for over 700 years before Jesus was born. They, of all people, should have been able to identify him as the Messiah who fulfilled this prophecy. And yet, many of them, especially among the more educated Jews in Jesus' day, were blind to the scriptures they claimed to know so well. When Paul preached at the synagogue at Antioch, he said that the Jews did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, and that they had fulfilled them in condemning him, Acts 13, 27. Now, since that time, Jewish theology has become even more blind to Old Testament prophecies of Jesus. Many Jews today believe a Messiah will come someday to vindicate the nation of Israel, but they don't believe that Messiah will be Jesus or anyone claiming to be what Christians believe about him. They reject the idea that the Messiah will be deity. They expect a national leader, a political savior. Jewish rabbis sometimes utter such nonsensical statements about the Messiah if and when he does arrive as, he who says does not know and he who knows does not say. So Jews today do not believe Isaiah or any of the other prophets prophesied of Jesus as the Messiah. Now this brings us to the question of this discussion. What do Jews say about Isaiah 53? How do they interpret it? If this is not a prophecy of Jesus, what does it mean and who is it about? And we're not asking this question because we're merely curious about what they believe. We're not discussing it solely because we want to convert Jews, although that is true. We're also examining this subject because Jewish interpretation has influenced Christian thinking. This has been happening for many years, and a lot of people don't realize it. I'll explain that more in a future lesson. I mention it now to encourage you to study this material carefully because Christian colleges have been affected by this thinking. 
For almost 1,000 years after Christ, most Jewish interpreters said that Isaiah 53 referred to an individual Messiah. But Rabbi Rashi, that is Solomon Itzaak, who lived from 1040 to 1105 AD, proposed another view of Isaiah 53. His interpretation is now a common Jewish belief. That interpretation is that Isaiah 53 is about the nation of Israel. In other words, the Jewish nation was led as a lamb to the slaughter. The people of Israel were despised and rejected of men. The Israelite nation was like sheep that had gone astray. This interpretation has become the standard view in Jewish circles and it's their typical response to Christian arguments based on Isaiah 53 being a prophecy of Jesus. Most of the time, Christians point out that Isaiah 53 cannot be about the Jewish nation because it uses singular pronouns, not plural. Isaiah says, he is despised and rejected, verse 3. He has borne our griefs, verse 4. He was wounded for our transgressions, verse 5, and so forth. And so preachers oftentimes argue, Isaiah 53 says he, not they. And if Isaiah was talking about the Israelite nation, he would have used plural pronouns like they and them. And so preachers argue, since Isaiah used the singular pronouns in Isaiah 53, he must have meant an individual, a person, not a nation of people. Now on the surface, this reasoning sounds valid. But the problem is that this point is not a conclusive argument against the Jewish view of Isaiah 53. In fact, an informed Jew has a quick response. He will correctly tell you that Isaiah refers to the nation of Israel in the singular several times in this book. That's usually because he refers to the nation of Israel by using the name of the head of that nation, Jacob or Israel. Sometimes God speaks to Israel in this book and refers to them in the plural. For instance, in Isaiah 41 verse 1, God said, Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. And Isaiah 48, 20 and 21, where God said, The Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob, and they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. But at other times, God used the name of the father of the nation, Jacob or Israel, to represent the people of that nation. He spoke as if he were talking to an individual. Now that's why these singular pronouns can refer to a whole nation of people. The head of the nation, and sometimes the king of the nation, stands by metonymy for the people in that nation. For instance, in Isaiah 43 verse 22, God said, You, and that is singular, have not called upon me, O Jacob. Isaiah 40, verse 27. Notice how he describes the whole nation in the singular. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my, not our, my way is hidden from the Lord. So again, this is not unusual in Isaiah, whether he refers to the nation of Israel or another nation, such as the Assyrian nation in chapter 10. Notice Isaiah 10, 5 through 7. There, God calls the nation of Assyria, him. I will send him against an ungodly nation, verse 5. And he, yet he does not mean so, verse 7. Other prophets refer to nations with singular pronouns as well. So the use of singular pronouns in Isaiah 53 by itself does not disprove the Jewish view of this chapter. So that brings us to the main argument of Jews about Isaiah 53. They point out that when God talks about my servant in this part of Isaiah, that is chapters 40 through 66, my servant, they say, means the nation of Israel and not an individual. And there are several verses where God does speak of his servant Israel. Therefore, could that servant be Israel in all those cases and yet be an individual Messiah, a single person in chapter 53? Before we respond, let's listen to someone in the Jewish community. Of all the hundreds of chapters of prophecy recorded in the Hebrew Bible, one chapter has become the most popular these days, Isaiah 53. It's the story of the suffering servant. 
Why has it become so popular? Primarily because a huge portion of the Christian people believe that Isaiah is referring to their choice for the Messiah. Their suffering servant, they say, is the Messiah. Could this possibly be true? So then who then was Isaiah speaking of as the suffering servant that's so famous? Look in the book itself. Eight or nine times in that book, Isaiah names the servant. God knew what he was talking about when he told Isaiah what to say. And through the prophet, God said, my servant, Jacob, my servant Israel, eight or nine times in that very book, Isaiah names the servant. If you're going to read the Jewish Bible, don't try to shape it and bend it into what you want it to say. It's all clearly written. What would you say in response to this argument? The first thing we should do is roll up our sleeves and do some homework. Let's look at the verses where God talks about his servant to see if this argument has merit. If you can open your own Bible, that will be great. But if not, you can follow with me on the screen. We won't go into the Hebrew word for servant because that won't help the Jewish case or the case that we're making. The Hebrew word for servant in these verses is evid. It just means servant. In the Old Testament, who that servant is and what kind of servant he is depends on how the word is being used. It could be a household servant. It could be the servant of a king. It can mean the servant of God in a spiritual sense. So there's nothing unique about the word evid that tells you that it's this or that kind of servant. It's a matter of context. That's the key to interpretation. This means that we will need to look at the verses in Isaiah where God talks about his servant to see how the word is used. So let's begin. In Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, But you, Israel, are my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham my friend. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and call from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. So God calls Israel his servant twice in these verses. There's no doubt about that. So let's go to the next example. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will wring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. This section is quoted in Matthew chapter 12, 15 through 21. Matthew says these words in Isaiah 42, were fulfilled in Jesus. The Lord worked quietly as the Messiah. He didn't make a lot of noise and call attention to himself like other kings. He didn't force his will on others and compel them to do what he said. And that description fits perfectly with the life and character of Jesus. Also, he brought justice to the Gentiles. His death brought justification to the Gentiles. The reception of the Jews and the Gentiles as equals and as brothers in one united spiritual kingdom is the great Old Testament mystery which was unveiled in the New Testament. Unbelieving Jews in New Testament times resented this idea and they continue to reject it today. The words of Isaiah 42 verses 1 through 4 correspond perfectly to the character and mission of Jesus. So we would not agree that the servant of the Lord in this passage is the Jewish people. Isaiah 42 verses 18 through 20 is another instance. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send. Who is blind as he who is perfect and blind as the Lord's servant seeing many things 
but you do not observe. Opening the ears, but he does not hear. Now here the words, my servant and my messenger, do refer to the nation of Israel. The context is different. This time God is condemning his servant, not commending them. The Jews in Isaiah's day were blind and deaf, spiritually speaking. Next, Isaiah 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. God's servant here is the nation of Israel. Isaiah is contrasting other nations and their gods with Israel and the true God. They were witnesses to the fact that what God said about the future had happened exactly as he said. Other nations could not say that about the gods they served. And incidentally, these verses do not in any sense justify the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses view. In this verse, God says there will be no God formed after him. But Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus is a God in John 1 verse 1 who was created. And that is a direct contradiction of this verse. Next, Isaiah 44 verses 1 and 2. Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Two times here, God identifies his servant as Jacob. So this must be, again, the house of Israel. The same is true in Isaiah 44, verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you, you are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. Then we find the same expression in Isaiah 44, verse 26, that we saw earlier in chapter 42, verse 18 through 20. Again, Isaiah refers to God's servant Israel in chapter 45, verse 4. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my servant's sake, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. This is in the context of the Jews' return to Jerusalem from Babylonian exile as a result of the decree of Cyrus, king of Persia. The return of the Jews from Babylonian captivity is again mentioned in Isaiah 48, verse 20. Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. The nation of Israel is clearly meant also in Isaiah 49, verse 3. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And that brings us to the passage on the suffering servant. In Isaiah 52, verse 13, God calls him my servant. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, God said, my righteous servant shall justify many. These are the verses in question. So what are we to conclude? Is God's servant in these verses the Messiah or the nation of Israel? The context determines the meaning of a verse or a word in a verse. Jewish rabbis know this well, and they appeal to this maxim and even split hairs when it serves their purpose. When we interpret the word servant in Isaiah, we ought to let the context inform us in every individual case of its use. Each use should be examined on its own and in conjunction with the overall theme of the book and the backdrop of the Bible as a whole. It is not a valid approach to say, well, in nine out of 10 cases, this word definitely has this meaning, therefore it must have that same meaning here in this verse. Now, it's usually helpful to see how the word is used in other verses, but just because a word is used in one way in other verses doesn't prove that it must be understood that same way in every case. And that's especially true when the context points to a different sense, which is exactly what we are about to see in Isaiah 53. But consider another Old Testament book where God talked numerous times about his servant. That book is Jeremiah. God called the nation of Israel, or Jacob, his servant three times in that book. God also called David his servant three times in that book. He even called Nebuchadnezzar his servant 
three times as well. So in each of these verses, the context indicates the meaning. Sometimes it refers to a group of people. At other times, it refers to an individual. The book of Isaiah is no different. The context of Isaiah 53 is not about the nation of Israel because there are phrases and expressions that cannot be harmonized with that interpretation. To start with, notice that the servant in this chapter is spoken to and spoken about. Keep your eye on pronouns like my, we, our, and him. Obviously, the section begins in Isaiah 52, verse 13, with God speaking, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. Notice that God speaks about the servant. He shall be exalted in verse 13. Look carefully then at verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man. God continues to mention the suffering servant in the third person. In verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. We know that he is God's servant, but who is the you in verse 14? In the context, God is promising the Jews that he will bring them home from Babylon. Isaiah 59 verses 9 through 12 says, the Lord will go before you, that is the Jewish captives. Now in verse 14, there is an analogy. Just as in the same way, many were astonished at you, even so likewise his visage or appearance was marred more than any man. Now, if you is the Jewish nation, then according to this interpretation, God is saying that the appearance of the Jewish nation will be marred just like many were astonished at the Jewish nation. I believe the New King James translators were right when they put a capital H for he and his in these verses, but they put a lowercase y for you in verse 14. They saw the analogy. They recognized the distinction. This is just one problem with standard Jewish thinking about this passage. The Jewish view of Isaiah 53 must overcome another hurdle as chapter 53 begins. Verse 1 says, who has believed our report? Who's speaking here? To whom does the word our refer? It can't be the Jewish nation. That's because whoever is speaking in verse 1 is talking about he and him which Jews say refers to Israel. This becomes even more of a problem in verse 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs. He was wounded for our transgressions. The Jewish nation can't be talking here. It wouldn't make any sense for the nation of Israel to say, he, the nation of Israel, was wounded for our, the nation of Israel's transgressions. So how do Jewish scholars respond to this problem? Well, they point back to Isaiah 52, verse 15. There they tell us that Isaiah mentions other nations with their kings and their reaction to the Jews' return to Jerusalem from Babylon. So the Jewish answer to the question, who are the ones who are talking about the servant in Isaiah 53, is typically Gentile kings. Now, according to this view, Gentile kings said the Israelite nation would grow up like a tender plant that men would despise and reject the Jews, that the Jewish nation bore the griefs of the Gentiles, verse 4, and so forth. This cannot be what Isaiah 53 teaches. This interpretation flies in the face of the consistent teaching of the Old Testament about the justice of God in holding nations accountable for their own sins. Now, notice how this looks at verse 5. But he... Israel was wounded for our, the Gentiles' transgressions. Then in verse 6, the Lord has laid on him, Israel, the iniquity of us all, all the Gentiles. This interpretation is a desperate attempt to get around the clear meaning of Isaiah's words. God did not punish the Jews for the sins of the Gentiles. He punished the Israelite nation for their own sins. This is what God warned their ancestors about before they entered into the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses said if they obeyed God, they could keep the land and prosper. That's Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 through 14. But he warned that if they disobeyed, then God would punish them. The Lord said in the rest of the chapter that he would scatter them from one end of the earth to the other. But the Jews, for the most part, didn't listen.
God sent the prophets to warn them. Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah pleaded with the Jews for 40 years to repent, but they wouldn't listen. That's why they suffered. The Assyrians invaded northern Israel in 721 B.C. and took many captives. The Babylonians attacked Judah three times, beginning in 605 B.C. God punished the Israelite people for their sins. He also punished the Gentile nations for their sins. When you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Obadiah, Habakkuk, and other prophets, you'll notice that God holds each nation accountable for its own transgressions. Not only do the other prophets teach this about the nation of Israel, but the book of Isaiah plainly shows that God's judgment would be poured out upon the nation of Israel for their sins. Who can read Isaiah chapters 1 through 6 and not see this? And this is even stated in the opening of Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 through 66 happens to be the section which Jews and liberal theologians say is only about the return from captivity. But notice how this section begins in Isaiah 40 verses 1 and 2. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Her sins, not the sins of other nations. Isaiah had already talked about God's judgment on Babylon, chapters 13 and 14, Moab in chapters 15 and 16, Damascus in chapter 17, Ethiopia and Egypt in chapters 18 through 20, and other Gentile countries in chapter 21. They paid for their own sins. So this contradiction should be abundantly clear. But Jewish scholars split hairs again. They tell us that Isaiah is saying that the Jewish people suffered because of the sins of the Gentiles. In other words, the Jewish nation suffered as a result of Gentile evil, especially what the Gentiles did to them. So Jewish interpreters remind us that God used Gentile nations like Assyria and Babylon to punish His people. And in that sense, God laid on Him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53 verse 6. But that abuses Isaiah 53 even worse. God did use the Gentiles to punish the nation of Israel, but He did not put all the sins of the Gentiles on His people. Besides that problem, verse 8 again teaches that the servant of the Lord suffered for the sins of the Israelite nation. We'll look at that verse in just a minute. Here is another reason, a clear and a strong reason, why the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is not and cannot be national Israel. I'm talking about the famous words in verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The Jews weren't silent when the Babylonians were about to attack. They were defiant, rebellious, proud, and argumentative. The Jews in the book of Jeremiah were not like innocent, unsuspecting sheep who didn't make a sound when they were about to be slaughtered. The prophet had been trying to warn them, but they wouldn't listen to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 25, 1 through 9. Does that sound like the image in Isaiah 53, verse 7? In Jeremiah 36, the prophet had Barak to write a scroll containing God's word and read it to the people. Jewish leaders seized him, and Jehoiakim, the king, cut the scroll in pieces and threw it in a fireplace. Does that sound like the image of a silent, docile sheep? The fact is, the Jews were not silent before the Chaldeans attacked or even afterward. They were stubborn and argumentative to the end. Even after the devastating siege in Jeremiah 39, the Jews that were left in Judah rebelled against the word of the prophet of God. The Chaldeans destroyed their land, but here is what the Jewish men told Jeremiah when he warned them not to go to Egypt. They said, As to the word you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you, but we will certainly do 
whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven. Jeremiah 44, 16 and 17. Does that sound like Isaiah's words? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. The fact is, the Jews would not shut their mouths even when they were warned and even after they were punished. We see the same obstinate attitude in Ezekiel. The prophet was in Babylon warning the Jewish captives that the war was not over. The final fall of their beloved city of Jerusalem was coming, but they didn't want to hear that kind of preaching. Several times in Ezekiel chapters 2 and 3, God said these Jews were a rebellious house. God Himself sure didn't think they were like sheep that yielded to tribulation without complaint. The Jewish interpretation of Isaiah 53 gets even worse in verse 8 and 9. Notice the statement in verse 8. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. Many Jewish interpreters would agree that God is speaking now in this chapter because it says my people, the Jewish people. So who is the he in this verse? He was stricken. The Jewish view says that the he in this chapter is the Jewish nation. But how can that fit with the context? This he was struck for the transgressions of my people. If the Jewish view is right, then the Jews were punished for their sins. But that's not what they say about verses 5 and 6. Jews today tell us that the he, the Jewish nation, was wounded for our, that is the Gentiles, transgressions. But verse 9 says, he, the Jewish nation, according to the Jews, had done no violence. Now there's only one conclusion we can rightly draw. God's people cannot be the he in verses 8 and 9. Otherwise, verse 9 would contradict verse 8. Let's go next to verses 10 and 11. Here again, we see Jewish theology at odds with itself and with Isaiah 53. Verse 10 says and talks about God making his soul an offering for sin. When you make his soul an offering for sin. Now, we've already seen the problem with saying that the nation of Israel was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. But now, in verse 10, it gets worse because the idea of a sin offering is mentioned. The Jewish nation, a sin offering for the Gentiles? Then look at verse 11. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He will justify many by bearing their sins. A sin offering in the law of Moses was made by the person who sinned. A Jew made a sin offering for his trespass, not for the sin of any other Jew, and certainly not for a Gentile sin. Also, Jews adamantly deny the sacrifice of oneself as a vicarious offering for the sin of others. So Jewish theology forbids what their view of Isaiah 53 requires. Furthermore, verse 11 says, He will bear their iniquities. But Jewish law says in Ezekiel 18 verse 20, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The Jewish nation could not bear the iniquities of the Gentiles as a sin offering. Thus, Israel could not be the he of this passage. Only Jesus the Christ could bear our sins and give his life as the perfect sacrifice for sin. Now, let's look at verse 12. We've already noticed that there are statements in this verse that correspond perfectly with the life of Christ. The fact that he was numbered with the transgressors, the fact that he bore the sin of many, which, by the way, does not merely mean that he bore the brunt of the sins of others, but more especially in verse 12, he made intercession for the transgressors. Now, intercession can be made in one of two ways. A person can make intercession against others. That's what Paul said Elijah did in Romans 11, 2 and 3. But on the other hand, there's a more common kind of intercession and that is interceding on behalf of others for their good. This is what Isaiah 53 is about, and the context makes that clear. If the he in this verse is Israel, my question is, when did Israel as a nation pray to God 
on behalf of the Gentiles for their good. Sometimes we see Jews going along with the Gentiles and following their sinful ways. Many times we see the anger of the Jews toward the Gentiles. But how often, if ever, do we read in the Old Testament of Jews praying that God might forgive the Gentiles, especially after the Gentiles had destroyed their land? Now the words of Isaiah 53, 12 fit perfectly with Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. But Isaiah's words in no way describe the attitude of Jews toward Gentiles in the Old Testament. There's another slightly different Jewish view of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Some say this servant is the faithful remnant of the Jewish nation, not the Jewish nation as a whole. It is true that a remnant of faithful Jews is mentioned several times in Isaiah. In fact, the book starts off by mentioning this small group. In Isaiah 1 verse 9, the prophet wrote, Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we should have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like to Gomorrah. It's clear in Isaiah chapters 40 through 66 that there were some Jews who remained loyal to God. But there are problems with saying that the suffering servant is the faithful few in the nation of Judah and not Jesus. First of all, even the faithful remnant were not innocent altogether. If anybody was true to God at the time of the Babylonian captivity, Daniel was. But even Daniel said that he, as well as other Jews, were suffering for their sins. So let's listen to Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel says in verse 4, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and with those who keep His commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. Neither have we heeded Your servants, the prophets, who spoke in Your name to our kings and to our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Now here he says they. Does this mean Daniel is using an editorial we and they in these verses? No. He specifically includes his own sins, and we'll see that in a minute. Verse 8 says, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, although we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet have we not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept this disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, you brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, O our God, 
Hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Notice this very carefully. Daniel says, now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Here Daniel specifically mentions his own sin. We don't know what his sin was, but Daniel was not perfect. He was not innocent. He was not sinless. He was suffering the consequences of his sin and the sin of the people. It is not a prayer of intercession for the Gentiles. It is a prayer of confession on behalf of the Jewish nation. Now, does that sound anything at all like what Isaiah said about the suffering servant? No. Isaiah 53 says that the servant is innocent. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says the servant was wounded for our transgressions, not his. He was bruised for our iniquities, not his. Isaiah 53 verse 9 says, The suffering servant had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. But Daniel, who was definitely part of the remnant, said he was guilty too. So the suffering servant can't be the faithful few in Judah. If we follow this interpretation, we run into even more trouble in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 19, the Bible says, Who is blind as the Lord's servant? Now, if his servant refers to the faithful remnant, then he's saying they were blind spiritually. Does that sound like the faithful few? In Isaiah 45, verse 4, God said to his servant, You have not known me. Did the faithful remnant not know God? There's another problem with this interpretation. Isaiah 53 verse 12 says, The servant bear the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Yet in his long prayer of intercession, Daniel made intercession for himself as well as for the people. But the servant in Isaiah 53 does not intercede for himself. He has no sin, according to verse 9. So the remnant view of Isaiah 53 won't work. It's just another attempt of unbelievers and other people as well to avoid the plain meaning and application of the text. Now, let's summarize the evidence against the Jewish interpretation of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and the evidence confirming the fact that this is about Jesus the Messiah. Number one. The nation of Israel is called God's servant numerous times in Isaiah, but each use of this word must be weighed in its context. Number two, the view of the servant being the nation of Israel does not harmonize with the context of Isaiah 53. The things that Isaiah said about the suffering servant in chapter 53 cannot be about Israel as a nation. Number three, it makes perfect sense to say that Isaiah called God's servant and also called Jacob God's servant and refers to Jesus as God's servant in Isaiah 53 because often the prophet mentions Jacob my servant because Jacob was the origin. He was the source of that nation, Israel. In the same way, Jesus was the ultimate aim of that nation. The Jewish nation existed to bring the Messiah into the world, not to be a perpetual race of chosen people with a permanent law. Its purpose was temporary as a means to that end. The Messianic view of Isaiah 53 is consistent with Old Testament passages and prophecies such as Psalm 22, Micah 5, 2, Zechariah chapter 11, 12, and 13, and many other passages that point to an individual, not a nation.
Number five, the view that Jesus is the suffering servant harmonizes with both secular history of the Jewish and Roman cultures of the first century, and finally, the messianic interpretation of Isaiah 53 fits perfectly with the New Testament record where these prophecies are fulfilled in detail in the life and death of Jesus. So the Ethiopian eunuch didn't know who was being talked about in Isaiah 53, but he had one thing right. He thought this section was about an individual, and he was correct about that. Thank God, Philip was there to help him connect the dots. The Bible says Philip began at this very scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached to him Jesus. This convinced the Ethiopian eunuch that Jesus was the Messiah and the Savior. He stopped the chariot at a place of water, and Philip baptized him for the remission of his sins. The last we see of the eunuch, he is on his way rejoicing. And all of this happened because he was reading about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. There's just something.